Frostpunk is a game about building a society. Sometimes societies go wrong. Frostpunk is a town building game by 11-Bit Studios, the creators behind This War of Mine. These guys like to make experimental games full of tough moral choices that will make you uncomfortable. This time, instead of a depressing war story, you get invited to the Donner Party. It takes place after a new ice age has plunged the world into an uninhabitable frozen hellscape during the late 1800s. Civilization has collapsed, but thankfully the British Empire predicted this and has constructed several steampunk generators that will be able to fight off the bitter cold through the sheer power of fossil fuels. They plan to evacuate their best and brightest to these in order to preserve the human race and rebuild society. There was some kind of complication, so they sent your group instead. You will need to make hard decisions. Sometimes it will be a choice between compromising your ethics or making survival much more difficult. You will either feel bad when you see the tragic consequences of your actions, or when you struggle to get by after taking the high road. Beyond survival decisions, you also need to decide how you'll shape the society that will outlive the rest of human civilization. Don't worry though, nobody's better at making societies than Victorian era British people. Frostpunk is a very interesting experience mechanically and narratively, even though it really undermines itself quite a bit with some frustrating design decisions. What it is good at though is setting up a dark and depressing tone, and making you feel like a bad guy no matter what you do. There aren't a lot of town building games like it. It even has an entire soundtrack of sad violin music. The core gameplay mechanics are somewhat simple. After you finish your journey through the cold and arrive at your generator, you need to manage your resources well, and your most important resource is your people. Educated citizens can do advanced work like being doctors or conducting research. Uneducated laborers can do just about everything else, and children are mostly just mouths to feed unless you do what must be done. Unlike most city builders, the real emphasis is on surviving, not thriving and developing. Calling it a city builder might even be a bit generous. The settlement you're in charge of is really closer to a giant homeless camp, like in Antarctic Los Angeles. It might be a city technically, but you aren't building any luxuries or parks, and like any British township, there's only one type of public building. Everyone is constantly on the brink of starving or freezing, but at least you don't have to worry about managing traffic. This is actually fun to some people? Who is this made for? The entire city is built around this giant global warming machine that keeps everyone warm and toasty. If it ever turns off for more than an hour or two, people will start to die, so acquiring coal is a constant priority. Initially, you can just pick some up off the ground, but once that runs out, you'll need to find more advanced ways to harvest it and meet the ever-increasing consumption of the generator as you upgrade it. The second most important priority is food, though, as no matter how warm your people are, they still need to eat. The menu consists almost entirely of polar bear carcasses, but thankfully you are leading a British expedition, so the poor food quality won't upset people all that much. There is also a secret menu item you can unlock later. While at first getting enough resources to survive will prove difficult, it gets worse later on when you realize that the amount you can generate is more or less capped by the amount of deposits you have for mines. But your population and city will keep growing and need more. Even more difficult than keeping the coal stores stocked is the task of managing the amenities of your population. You will need to keep their homes and workplaces heated, which becomes more difficult as the temperature drops. Unless you are willing to expend ungodly amounts of coal, some places will always be underheated, which will lead to frostbite and sicknesses that put people out of commission for a while. So you need to build medical buildings too. These tend to have low capacities and will be quickly overwhelmed after a cold snap gives half your population hypothermia. The game doesn't really have much end game content. While the struggle to keep everyone alive and get enough resources to maintain that aliveness stays fresh for the whole game, your methods and options never really change. You are able to send out scouts to search the world map for new survivors and resources, but besides lore tidbits, you will be getting the same types of rewards every time. The closest thing to endgame content I can think of are probably the automatons you can build that automate buildings, and the outposts you can set up to harvest resources from the world map, I guess. Besides increasing the population of people you need to take care of and lowering the temperature further, the game doesn't do anything to break the monotony besides giving you super difficult and interesting story objectives like get 8,000 coal to not lose. What makes Frostpunk unique though is the amount of tough decisions you'll have to make. You have to answer a lot of dilemmas where you have the option to do something unethical for a survival advantage, like uh, dumping bodies in a pit and harvesting their organs instead of giving them respectful burials, or sending children to work in the coal mines. Unlike a lot of games with morality systems, Frostpunk doesn't judge you if you decide to take one of these options, but it does show you the consequences. 
Oftentimes after making a decision you'll see little events that have barely any effect on gameplay, but show you the result of an action you took, which can be gut-wrenching if you are immersed into the game world and taking it seriously. Whether or not it was necessary or worth the cost though is up to you, mostly. You can also get feel-good events for making nice decisions, and it can be fun to try and build the perfect society, but it is easy to be nice when you aren't starving. Sometimes it can feel like your only options are to sacrifice your ethics you wanted to maintain or to lose. Being a leader isn't just about keeping people alive, though. You also need to capture their hearts and minds, because you will be the one blamed and cast out to die if your people are unhappy enough. You will have to manage their discontent and hope by managing their needs and making laws. Discontent represents the unhappiness of the people for tangible reasons, like being starved or cold. Discontent will rise very quickly if you aren't proactive in meeting everybody's basic needs well enough, and it is probably the single most dangerous factor to your well-being. You see, these people aren't particularly considerate. Despite living in a literal frozen hole, they will have to blame all the suffering they have to go through directly on you, the guy in charge. If this gets bad enough, they will banish you, so you need to keep them happy unless you want to go find Santa Claus. Hope is similar, but it is nowhere near as important. On higher difficulties, it feels like you're stretched too thin to keep everyone happy. You simply can't feed every single person or heat every single house, but your people will just keep getting angrier and angrier. While there are some temporary ways to remedy discontent, they aren't very effective, and you will need to start taking an active role in shaping your society if you want to keep the masses from ripping your throat out. You do this by either promoting order and discipline, or faith in a higher power. It starts with mandatory morning gatherings or evening prayers to boost unity, and the construction of guard towers or churches all over the city. Then after you make a few more decisions, you're suddenly in a totalitarian state with armed militias or non-believers are being beaten in the town square every night. It's designed to be a slippery slope, where you enact policies for the little bonuses they give without paying attention to the creeping implications of what you're actually doing. Increasing your level of dystopian control over society has nothing but positive effects, for you, the leader. Sure, propaganda lets you keep hope high, and prisons keep discontent low, and your personal army or society of warrior monks can break up protests and protect you from the people you're oppressing, but the game shows you the consequences of your actions through the awful little things that happen to individual people because of you. If you don't care about anything that isn't a number on your screen though, feel free to take the plunge. You can eradicate hope completely, and it becomes easier to execute dissidents to scare the discontent out of people than it is to actually try to fix their problems. The important thing is that the game never draws a line for you. The paths you can take aren't inherently bad after all. The guards you hire can be used to break up protests, but they also keep the streets safe and are well liked by the people. While it is obvious that the public executions at the end are bad, the point where you go too far is ambiguous. Is it evil to build propaganda centers? Sure you're printing lies, but you could honestly want to help people and just want everyone on the same page. Is it evil to build prisons? Our real life society is prisons and they seem alright. Is it really that evil to torture non-believers? Maybe some public executions are necessary, this guy did profane symbols of the faith after all. The game never forces you to be the bad guy. You can be a well-intentioned extremist who uses every tool available to keep people alive, and sacrifices individual freedom for the well-being of everyone. Or you can just be evil and use daily executions to stop discontent while doing nothing to improve their living conditions. Or you can be good and keep society free and pure of corruption even if that makes your people harder to control. While the basics of what I've talked about apply generally to every city you'll build, what scenario you choose will determine the goals and story events of your game. A new home is the default scenario of sorts, and it's kind of the default Frostpunk experience. You're just a normal group of British people setting up a normal settlement all according to plan. You can even rely on another bigger settlement called Winterhome in the area to help you out. <sighs> After hearing that Winterhome has been destroyed, a lot of your people decide to form a faction and go back to London, because they don't remember that London was already destroyed when they left it, I guess. Clearly they must be insane, because nobody would ever wish to go back to London after leaving. You can use the carrot or the stick to deal with these idiots. In my run I used a bunch of sticks held by scary men. You discover the evil American Lightning City, and then build up into a proper settlement. Then you just have to survive a big storm with some of the hardest music imaginable. The fire from this track warmed up the whole city by three heating levels. A new home is great, but like a bad hand job, the ending cinematic really rubbed me the wrong way. Like it tells you if you went too far or not. By whose judgment? How far is too far? Doesn't this completely undermine the game encouraging you to judge yourself by showing realistic consequences but not imposing judgment on you directly through words or punishment? The next scenario is the arcs. It isn't good. You play as a bunch of nerds trying to preserve seeds through the long winter until the world becomes warm again so you can plant them. 
The gimmick is that you have a low population, so you need to rely on robots to do manual labor. And you have these buildings that can never get cold or you lose. It really is just very dry and monotonous. You don't even get to shape your society because I guess you have too few people, so you just sit there. The twist is that you discover another struggling settlement nearby and you have to decide whether or not to spend resources to help them. Potentially spending what you need to save the Arcs on saving them from the storm. Or you can just get enough to save both them and your Arcs and win. Or you can be like me and not realize how urgent the deadline was so you just get caught with your pants down and don't have enough resources to save either. This scenario is just so boring and it doesn't even have a storm like a new home. The damn storm takes place off screen. The Refugees, however, is the best scenario easily. You play as a group of poor workers who stole a bunch of boats meant for the rich to build a city on their generator. Initially, you just have to deal with receiving large waves of other refugees who will push your city to the brink and trying to feed and house all of them, but once that is taken care of, everything seems alright. Then the evil murderous rich people who wanted to kill you show up, but by the time they get there they no longer want to kill you and have become desperate, and are willing to put their differences aside if you let them into your city. You get a lot of choices in how to resolve this issue. You can choose whether or not to let them in, or how you treat them once you do let them in, and everyone in your city hates them because of the acts they committed in the past. I didn't bother with any of that and just didn't let them in. They stole some food from us so we formed an angry mob and went to their little camps. I got the we didn't kill the lords but they deserved it ending. Those are the most interesting ones at least. There are a few DLC scenarios that I haven't played. Fall of Winterhome is a prequel where you play as the other city that died in the A New Home campaign. The Last Autumn is almost a spin-off based on how different it is from normal Frostpunk, since you play as the people building the generator before the apocalypse. On the Edge is about being a settlement that can't do anything on its own, and you need to trade with your neighbors or something. I suppose if you are really hungry for more Frostpunk it might be a good idea to check these out, but I think the base 3 scenarios in Endless Mode are the ideal way to experience this game. Overall, it's a solid town builder with some interesting core mechanics, but the reason I think it's good is because of the dynamic story you're confronted with through your actions. My best word of advice is to try to immerse yourself in the game, really take the consequences of your actions in, and really think about what you're doing. Trust me, you'll have a much better experience if you're immersed. If you try to distance yourself and just focus on the mechanics of gathering coal, you won't find what it has in that department to be super engaging. What makes Frostpunk special is how it makes you feel desperate and helpless, never having enough resources and having to cross your own lines just to survive. If that sounds fun to you, definitely check it out. If that doesn't sound fun, you should look at pictures of the Shackleton Expedition and sad Victorian children in factories for an easier version of the same experience. A late Merry Christmas to everyone. I'm really glad the Intervenus video is doing so well. That is really making me confident that I can just cover any random game I think is cool on this channel. Also, since I got some great turnout on that poll, I'm going to have to answer the call. I'm going to finish this video off with a question. Do you enjoy hurting other people?